What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Cheeky Midweeky, where we are making strength and conditioning not boring anymore. And our guest, uh, we were just talking off air, Scott Prohaska. He is talking about how hockey in Southern California is, it's not dead. It's, it's actually a growing, vibrant thing. So, Scott, introduce yourself, and then let's dive right back into this with uh, the hockey stuff. Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me on. Like, I really enjoy listening to all the guests on here and it's just it's just great to hear everybody's perspective on stuff you always learn something that or, rem- or remember something you forgot to work on and thank you for being on i forgot to say yeah. that so thank you for being on yeah. um yeah it's uh you know the hockey thing uh that's that's where our, our facility is located in a, in a hockey arena the owner of the anaheim ducks he saw a stat five years ago that um showed that youth registration and youth participation in hockey in Southern California, booming. Like number three state in the U.S. behind Jersey and Minnesota. And he's like, what is this? Like, how is this happening? And then the competitive, you know, he's a big business guy and, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, owns the Anaheim Ducks. And, and uh, he said, why aren't we number one? And so, yeah, yeah, what, so, like, yeah, like that's the first thing that came to his mind after he saw that we were number three. Instead of wow, this is incredible. It's like why aren't we number one? And so, but the reason was there there wasn't enough rinks. People were driving all over the place trying to get their kids ice time. So he plunked down 120 million of his own money, built this incredible facility, all glass on the outside, four sheets of ice, one Olympic. Um, U.S. U.S. figure skating moved moved their headquarters here. One of their headquarters here, his Anaheim Ducks have their whole locker rooms and their their kitchen and their practice facility here, and uh, and they wanted to build a training center. They hired me initially just to design it and build it, and then it went so well they ended up offering me the lease and said we'd like you to take you know take on the AAA teams and develop some of the athletes. And so we've worked with you know, a lot of hockey in the last five years. So, and I had a little bit of a hockey background because I lived in Toronto and Niagara area for most of my life. So that's unbelievable, man. How, like yeah. the first, first yeah. question that comes to my mind with that is how did you get, how, how did you get hooked up with him? Cause everybody listening right now might be like, all right, well, how do I get a, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, how do I get yeah. somebody to do that for me? <laughs> yeah, It's always relationship built. Be honest with you. That's a big part of the industry. If you have good relationships and good reputation, you know, you're going to, uh, you're, you're, you're going to find, probably find some opportunities. So, I mean, I, I trained a bunch of pros on his team and, um, uh, so what had happened is they, they basically did a lot of research and we're looking at, you know, what, what is the needs of the hockey parent, the hockey coach? They did a really good job. They figured that the normal journey of a young hockey player uh, is get out of school, your mom or dad pick you up, you go to hockey practice, you then they have to pick you up from hockey practice, drive you to get something to eat, drive you to your trainer in some strip mall, you're doing your homework on the in the car on the way home, and then you're back at that routine again. So they said when they built this place, they had a great idea. They said, well, let's put... Uh, classrooms here with tutors we'll build a great restaurant and snack bar and we'll build a training center so you can just stop here and just have everything done right here so they're pretty smart in how they did that yeah because they went around the world and asked questions to every rink that was newly built in minnesota in czech republic and toronto and they and they found out what the holes were and they they built an incredible facility here and you know i walk out my door and see palm trees and mountains and you know 10 minutes from the beach so doesn't suck put it that way yeah <laughs> that <laughs> no, sounds yeah. absolutely gorgeous yeah, um, yeah and what is your so what are you doing in the um in that facility are you running the day-to-day operations are you programming what what exactly do yeah. you do with there yeah all, all the above so, i mean i've got a nice a good staff right we're always looking to grow staff as well um so we do uh obviously we've got probably about 90 amateur athletes and about 30 uh 30 adult athletes that are just what's the age range on your amateur athletes if you don't mind me asking uh uh, 13 to 22 pretty much is what we have so between hockey volleyball football uh baseball uh that's a lot of what we get and then we get figure skating we'll take on some younger because that's an early specialization sport which is very interesting to train by the way a lot of dynamics Mm. in early specialization sports which is you know, my my regulation is only, there's only a couple of them, right? There's gymnastics, there's figure skating, there's ballet, and some people, some scientists say swimming is actually early specialization. But what you see in that sport is, 
it's very a lot of navigating when it's early specialization of what you have to do with athletes and and things like that so um yeah it's interesting the figure skating thing but like the people behind us they they won the worlds this year our clients we've had them for five or six years and that's you know yeah olympic silver and and won gold at the in the world the world champions which is a nice notch in our belt that we're able to do that right and improve their performance that over a couple of years to where they peak at the right time and do that so yeah but that's the, unbelievable the congratulations to you all that's yeah uh, thanks that was exciting for us we we're really proud of that so especially where they were when, when we got them right they were all banged up and they were considering retiring and you know weren't really weren't at, yeah weren't at their peak and uh, yeah, and then to put everything together and help them do that. So, so what was the secret kinda... for success with figure skating? You kind of teased it. We'll get back to the hockey, but yeah, yeah. Tease, tease that out. Well, one, keep them healthy, right? Like they're they're on the ice so much. And, and if you ever get a chance, so Nathan Chen, the world champion, could be considered the GOAT of all time male figure skating. He he trains here and does, we don't train him, but he, he, sometimes he comes to the gym and does his Olympic program for the Olympic training center. But, uh, but he skates here with his coach. And if you watch these athletes, if you get to go on, watching it on NBC is one thing, be on the ice with them or right on the boards with them and watch him do a quad in the air and land on one foot on ice on a blade. You're like, it's, this is impossible. You think NFL receivers are, are athletic? Watch this. So, you know, two things, three things you got to really look at. The type of jumps they're doing, okay, you really look at it. Some of it's really squat jump, not counter movement jump. So we look at some of those things and whether it's short coupling, long coupling, all that kind of stuff. Um, the endurance factor, because their long program is three minutes, and they sometimes have to hit a quad or a triple towards the end of that. And there's tons of lactate and fatigue. So local muscular endurance versus VO2 max, we worked on that a lot with them. And the, the thing that's the biggest challenge is rotational speed. You'd think doing Russian twists or back extensions and this stuff would help. It doesn't. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of an innate thing they have, but, but it's, the, it's one of the number one factors. It, we, can, we all know we can improve vertical and stuff. And on the ice, it's a little harder, and we've done a good job of it. But getting them to rotate faster and hold that rotation, that's unique. If, you, if someone can figure that out, they're going to make a lot of money. So, is that just all isometric strength? Like hearing you say that, like is that almost the same as like a jujitsu person? Pretty, pretty similar. It's in, it's in that. That's the kind of stuff we started doing to just get them to hold that isometrically, and not really worry about the rotate, but just don't come undone, right? Don't, don't change the centrifugal force by coming undone a little bit. The weaker kids come undone a little bit. So we're, we're doing stuff like that, and I mean, anecdotally, it, it worked. <laughs> you know, for and we've got some twelve-year-old, thirteen-year-old figure skaters that are doing pretty well that we're working with between, you know, really hitting those categories, making sure they have enough muscular endurance, which is real mitochondria health in the quads and the glutes. Not, yeah, because we you can have we test their VO2 max, and and some of them are off the roof, yet they still fatigue two minutes in. How do you test it? What do you, what are you gonna what's your test? Uh, the watt bike. I'll put okay. them on a three minute. So what we do is we'll take. Uh, body weight in kilograms times five and that number tells me the watts i want you to hold for three minutes body weight in kilograms yep. times five. times five times five yeah is the watts is the watts uh that you want them to hit for three three minutes hold that hold that i'll have i'll get them to that wattage on the watt bike and i say hold it for three minutes now and it's a pretty brutal test but that what, tells what bike me are you guys using uh, just WAP, whatever WAP bike is, whatever the nope. the main brand is. Yeah, I like nope. it. I like. I, I think it's really good. So I think there's two different things. Same with football. Same with field sports. Same with hockey. You know, VO2 max is one thing, but local muscular endurance, the the, the size and the health of that mitochondria. You know, can you really push limits of fatigue through mu mu local muscular endurance to where they don't fatigue? Like that's one thing I, I, I take pride in. My athletes don't fatigue. Whether it's a modern day football player, high school football player, the D our DNs just go, they have motors, man. They do not quit for four quarters. Our D linemen, it's unbelievable. Our DBs, they're flying around the field because between VO2 max and, and local muscular endurance, I, I take care of that. I think that's very important to, to, to give, give athletes, you know, that type of bucket, right? <clears throat> when I heard you talk about landing the quad, it made me yeah. think 
strength coaches that love the program, um, snap downs, like there's, yeah. there's no way you're doing snap downs with your athletes. No like, no, no, yeah, like no. this just, I mean, cause the, you talked about coming down from a quad on a single yeah. leg on a blade. Like, is there yeah. research out there on the ground reaction forces from landing with that much centrifugal force and rotation? Yeah. Like, what is it? Yeah, yeah. It's I, I don't know the exact numbers. What it is, uh, it's pretty high. I mean, I think I, I know on the hamstring and the upper hamstring and the glute, landing off a throw when the girls are being thrown, it's oh, like five gosh, times. Yeah. It's like five or six, five or six times body weight. Like when you when you see this couple here, Alexa Kernum and Brandon Frazier, when you see him throw her in the air, 15, 20 feet in the air, and she does two, three spins and lands on one foot eccentrically. Yeah. There's there's some strength that needs to be in that right and some timing as well. So right, yeah. Oh my, and yeah. and you know what? Like you're saying all of this, and I I hope all of our listeners are thinking the exact same thing. Like so often, nobody's like, oh, figure skaters are strong. That's unbelievable oh. strength. Oh, I mean the the isometric strength, the concentric strength they have to display uh, is incredible, incredible. Plus, plus the athleticism. I, it all boils down to to kind of what Dan Paff was kind of saying in, in, in one of the, you know, the ones you did recently with him. I think that for any sport or any sporting movement, you have to, or at least the athletic moves, whether it's jumping, running, throwing, kicking, whatever, right? You have to, as, whether you're a strength coach or you want to be more in the performance coach and, and be all to the athlete where you're measuring everything, like Dan gets that, you know, you know, he gets to cook the whole meal and grocery shop, right? And, hmm. and do that. So, um, I think you have to first have a biomechanical model of how you think, you know, within, within guardrails of how this athlete needs to move. And then you need to have a physical model of what types of strengths, what types of elasticity or types of contractions, types of angles they need to get in, right, as well as the biomechanical model. And then you can start playing with what's the limiting factor. Is it a physical factor or a technical factor that's going on here, right? Um, yeah, so so I think you know that's that's always what I've been lucky enough to be in the industry long enough to <clears throat> have biomechanical guys I can call or have someone that's world champion figure skaters that are retired, you know, and talk to them and say what what did you think? What was your mechanical model? What did you think this jump had to be? Where the knee has to be? Where the hands need to be? All that type of stuff. And and when you study that, then you can start looking at things to train, right? outside of just the general prep stuff so yeah and hearing you say that makes me wonder kind of very similar to you talked about swim being an early specialization gymnastics um, these sports where because it is so specialized do you think that this is one of those sports where if there's another strength coach out there listening they're like hey um, or it's they're new to it is this one of the sports where the sport coach should have just complete say in what goes on because you know people talk about high performance and strength coach planning practice blah 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 but like how do you break down technical tactical you know s small sided games all these things that we've talked about on the show before yeah. Yeah. and our yeah. guests have but yeah. how you can't do that as a strength coach like you really have to lean on the strength the sport coach yeah big big rub in the figure skating world even in the hockey world a little bit the, the more technical the sport Hockey, quarterbacks, right? We do a lot of quarterbacks. We work, work with a lot of NFL and successful high school quarterbacks we work with. The more technical it is, the more control I think you need to have as a performance coach and maybe monitor everything because there's a big, big rub in the figure skating world between coaches that do not want their athletes sore on the ice, do not want them fatigued on the ice because of all the technical and choreography that needs to be nailed and skill sets developed constantly because you have a small window. It's early specialization. So they're always complaining about strength conditioning guys. Strength conditioning guys are always complaining about you're doing too much on ice. They're fatigued. They can't get stronger. So, you know, I partnered with the coaches and we were meeting constantly, like every day everyday meeting i'd go out on the ice and watch them and talk and so it was a big collaboration to get to get in an early specialization sport or high skill sport like quarterbacking you, you got to collaborate you cannot be a silo just kind of you know he needs strength he needs rotator cuff strength he needs hip rotation i'm gonna give him that right <laughs> yeah and, 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 and then wish it's gonna i hope it's gonna work it takes if you really want performance you want someone performing at their best 
you're going to have to collaborate big time or take it over yourself and understand mm. all that. Mm. Like I said, Dan, you know, Dan, some of the best guys in track, they get the, you know, grocery shop and cook the meal themselves, right? So, because they control everything. And that's kind of the path I've taken. And I've known Dan, you know, I've met him since the 90s, right? I was on the track in Oregon, you know, when he was coaching and stuff like that. So, um, it's kind of a... You know, there's there's so many things to learn in this field. You know, I've got my model of, of performance that we look at, but <laughs> this is how I was telling a, a younger strength coach this the other day that, you know, by the time you learn about rehab, you learn about biomechanics, all the different training methodologies and, and contractions and jumping and, you know, all the ju- types of jumps you can give people and progressing all this stuff. And, and then you want to work on some psychological or tactical stuff if you're giving me that. By the time you get comfortable finally doing that, probably time to retire because <laughs> that's how <laughs> to, to feel comfortable. Like I feel comfortable now analyzing an athlete, looking at the constraints of what might be limiting them. I'm going to take my best guess, and then and then and then you know, using the scientific method, test it, train them, retest it, train them, see if it's working, test their performance, and now it's getting close to retirement time for me it takes you're so long. right though you really are <laughs> yeah. yeah fuck you hit you know, the or, or you could go the other or you could go the other route and say i get them strong i get them healthy and you do what you want with them right that's another way to look at it i chose i didn't choose that that path i chose the other path so uh you know blending the the field uh, excuse me blending the figure skating in the ice hockey world what are you know, we've had Anthony Donskoff on and, and did a presentation on biomechanical stuff for hockey, um, you know, mm-hmm. for me to learn it better and for our, our other listeners out there. Like, I feel like everybody talks about groin strength or what are some just basic, you mentioned Dan, heuristics for figure skating, blending it into then, okay, this is heuristics for hockey, you know, your, your guiding principles. Well, power. <laughs> okay, power. Um, What's your you know, definition I, of it? Is it the true, well, you know, how, work in, in the amount of time? What do you? Yeah, yeah, and, and and really, you're looking at horsepower to curb weight ratio. Really, that's what it is. I, I want to look at your power to body weight ratio, and I want to see how much power you can generate in different movements, right? And how are and, you measuring it? Uh, we, can, I mean, we, we have force plates. We've got all stuff like that. We can look at different impulse and for and power, propulsive power asymmetrical stuff and when i and i look at that I, I think first my approach is i still honestly you know maybe a little more rare at the upper level that I, but i still build an athlete first i look at their athletic movements and how they move hockey players when they first get off the ice and this is a big knock that that i challenge you know a lot of a lot of hockey coaches or hockey trainers back east and stuff hockey hockey players can't sprint they they run like retards right and i'm like come see mine i go come see mine they look like sprinters because i train them that way right they jump like jumpers like volleyball guys and basketball guys because i train it's important for us to build that athleticism those traits of jumping running throwing cutting i still do that even with the elite guys Jeff Moyer and I had a conversation. We were going to do a, an article together that said, because he came out and helped me with some of the elite quarterbacks that I work with. And, and you know, if you look at just pure athleticism, jumping, running, throwing, kicking, you know, cutting, and they suck at it. They're not great movers, right? And does that mean you're a great athlete? Because you're performing at a high level tactically and technically, but you're not that good athletically. Are you a great athlete? Or do you, do you consider someone a great athlete because they can do it all, right? They can do everything. They can run. They can jump. They can cut. They can do everything really, really well. Um, you know, one of our athletes that we've worked with for a lot of years is Bryce Young, right? And Bryce does a lot of things really well. He cuts very, very well. He sets you up very well. He accelerates very well. He throws very well. So he's used our biomechanical model of all that. So we've, we, we started working with him when he was 14 years old. So, Holy cow. Yeah. 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 So I still believe in, in building athletes, like building athleticism, even at the highest level, you're going to get a touch of that. And then we're going to, you know, the higher level you are, we're going to specialize in, in, in looking at the biomechanics of it and, and looking at, 
you know, the things you have to do. You have to throw the ball really well and accurately. Okay, let's increase the, the power and the accuracy of that and the efficiency of that. You have to figure skate. You have to do multiple, multiple things. Okay, which ones are you naturally good at? Which ones are weaknesses? You know, let's look at the biomechanics of what you have to do when you do a triple sow cow. What you have to do when you have to do a, you know what I mean? A, a, yeah. a quad. And let's break down what those movements actually are and let's increase the horsepower and, and the accuracy of that. That's kind of my model in looking at it. But it's still, you're still going to work on being an athlete. I want to see you run well. I want to see you jump well. Even my figure skaters, when I teach them how to do some sprint drills, they feel better and more explosive on the ice. Now, that's anecdotal, right? But it's still, <laughs> well, you know, I've got enough of them from 12 years old to world champions that are all You could even say it's not anecdotal at that point, yeah. Yeah, right, right. They're all saying the same thing. I feel springy. I feel explosive. I feel tighter, you know, from, all the, from being an athlete. So that's kind of my model, you know, looking at it that way. For your figure skaters, when you talk about the strength of body weight, it made me think about um, Lance Armstrong's book that I had read back in the day when it was either before the PED, I don't know. Long story yeah. short, it was in the book where he talked about being on the razor where, or whatever, where it's like, I have to yeah. be this certain body weight and you can't be above, yeah. can't be below. How serious is that in figure skating and yeah. in hockey or the other sports that you're working with? Well, yeah, I, I, I those two, uh, huge. One, psychologically, they just know what weight they feel good at. And we've got an in-body, we test some stuff. Um, yeah, so we're, we're always testing that type of stuff. And, and I, don't, I just don't do the in-body. I also, I've got a background with Charles Polican, so I do a little bit of his biosig, and we'll do 12-point, and we'll test, we'll test a couple things and keep saying with a coach, how are they performing? We'll do some bi- metrics on them at this weight, at this body comp, how, we, how they feel in here. If I put a little muscle on them, they're going to feel maybe a little different for first, but can we hold that muscle and see if it feels better? You're always playing with things like that, right? Hockey is very interesting because uh, – there's some research out there that shows that in the NHL, your lean body mass, overall lean body mass, just not muscle mass, is re- to your centimeters in height is a ratio that's almost identical for every guy. So I think it might be one to one. I've got to check the, 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 the research again. But if you're 5'10 and you know, you're, you're going to have a certain ratio of centimeters to height lean mass, and it's almost every N- 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 NHL guy fits that criteria. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So those types of sports, yeah, when you're moving your body a lot, yeah, it's probably important to to track it and and get a feel for how the athlete's performing at different weights and different things. You know, the football stuff where it's a lot more contact and, you know, moving people, maybe it's a wider range. But if it's just you and your body weight, sprinting, figure skating, you know, hockey, you're gonna find you're gonna find some some comp- body composition stuff that that's probably gonna make some sense to you. Now it's interesting you said that about hockey and because to me I'd call hockey a, a you know a very big collision sport too. But you don't think it's as like are people not as concerned about gaining weight or adding armor to their body because they wear more padding in that sport or that that sport is go- it goes like this all the time like this this. Guys want to be fast. The, the game's changing, Scott. The game's changing, they tell me, right? But physics isn't changing, I tell them, right? <laughs> and that whole horsepower to curb weight ratio. Well, it's, it's a game of acceleration, right? I think yeah. Jake Jensen will tell you from the Kraken, he, you know, he's a great guy, and he'll tell you, you know, the research they're doing, if the guys that are hitting max velocity in the ice, yeah, you're probably down 5 nothing because you're chasing dudes the whole time. Right, the guys that can accelerate to the positions they need to be in, or the spots they need to be, so they get the pass, or they get the open netter, or whatever, the acceleration, stopping and starting, that's where the game is won, and no fatiguing. Right, that they don't fatigue. These guys don't fatigue. The best guys don't fatigue. So it's it's, you know, even in field sports, I'm a huge. I've always been this, and you see a lot of research coming out now, and I'm kind of proud of our team that we've done this for 10 years now we believed in acceleration out of cuts acceleration out of breaks that was in team sports what we focused on when we touch on velocity top velocity a little bit to protect the hamstrings and give you a little dose but i don't see it in those sports in soccer football lacrosse i don't see the top velocity thing being a a competitive advantage really that much i mean if now listen if you're if you're tyree kill and some of these guys right that is a huge 
competitive advantage. But do you want to play that game? You want to go try to chase that type of speed and put all your eggs in that basket? Because Tyree Kill was the Jesus Christ of speed when he was born. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And that's where you talk about the – Kears talked about this before with the tail – the fat tail distribution or, um, you know, normative uh, data sets like yeah. speed. Okay, the, let, let's use Tyreek Hill. Okay, 23 miles an hour. The slowest yeah. person, 16. All right, that's yeah. a range of seven miles an hour. Um, yeah. But even like your acceleration off your first step, maybe wh- whatever, five, six, seven yeah. meter, yeah. maybe. Um but the ability to put your foot in the ground, accelerate, change direction, that yeah. is much – it's a bigger multiplier. So put your yeah. eggs in that basket. And yeah. that's why on our episode with Dan, like you mentioned, we talked more about change in direction than max velocity because right. the right. greater demands on the body when changing direction and the fact of like what Kier's been saying for a while though, like put your eggs in the basket that has the non-normative distribution. I, we've had good. We've doubled down on that for ten years now. Just just thinking out of a gut instinct. This was this was what we saw the best athletes doing. And 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 you know, except, when they say guys, you know, hockey, football guys, soccer guys, this, the game's changing, Scott. The game's changing. I say physics <laughs> hasn't. It's about. It's still about accelerate. It's about. It's about high forces right now, right? High forces right now. Whereas I actually think, and he may get mad at me for saying this, but I think what Dan is really brilliant at is eliminating braking forces in his sprinters. He gets them so efficient that they don't slow down. He's not that much of a strength guy, acceleration speed guy. He's actually a don't slow down guy. <laughs> he gets his athletes really eliminating braking forces, you know, and all the stuff he understands about biomechanics and hydraulics and fascia and stuff like that. Um, and I, I got the same background as him with the same people. And, and he's so good. And that's what I think top velocity is. He's just eliminating braking forces, really, <clears throat> at, that, yeah. at that thing. And that's not something we double down on a lot. We double down on all these different positions you're going to get in. How fast and mechanically sound can you accelerate out of that? And then, and then we start throwing tactical training on. Can you set guys up? Can you understand what the, you know, what's going on out there? And, and play with your accelerations to make guys miss or create space or close space, now you've got a player, if you ask me. Do you have any relationship or um, learning from Lauren Landau? Because those are some things I remember learning from him about the ability to reaccelerate after you've made you know multiple different types of change in direction and the same heuristic of get your foot back underneath your center of gravity, yep. that That's horizontal That's orientation. It. but. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't spoke to him about it. I've, you know, had some guys that played for him when he was, you know, at Denver and stuff like that, and he loved the way they moved. I know that. So, um, yeah. Uh, so we're probably thinking the same way. Um, but yeah, we have we have a mechanical biomechanical model of cutting in here, where the foot needs to be landing on the inside edge of the foot. You know, the way we teach it is almost like a like a like a ski, right? The inside edge of the foot is the brake the ball and the big toe is the accelerator. I don't want you landing on the accelerator. I want you hitting the brake and pushing off again because that creates a ground reaction force. It stiffens. Quick break from the show to remind you to hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out and it helps you be notified when we have new content get released. So again, please hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoy this content. And with that, let's get back to the show. Right, where this can soften and do this and beat, beat up your accelerator too much. And we get, you know, we get the foot outside the center of mass and, and the right, the right uh, vector, you know, with where you want to go. And Newton's, you know, physics, Newton's third law, right? For every force, there's an opposite reactive force. If I put my foot here, I'm going to go this way. If I put it here, I'm going to go this way. So we, we teach a lot of that in our field sport athletes. And, you know, when it talks about, when we talk about acceleration, high forces now, right? That's acceleration, right? But also... You've got to be in the right positions to direct those forces. So we look at if there's any kind of constraint in mobility or, or coordination that we can't get the knee in the right position or that kind of thing. So that's what we're looking for. But it's high forces now is what we're looking for in acceleration. And, and you know, like I said, you add tactical on top of that. Well, that's, that's Bryce. That's where Bryce Young is brilliant. He'll use our cutting actions and he'll time it with a guy and just set him up unbelievably. Right. So you talk oh, – keep going, Tark. No, I, that's good. Yeah. What I was going to say is 
as you're talking about all of this, we just filmed a reaction video that one of our members sent in of Lamar Jackson training in the sand. And you've seen people training in the sand and you talk about Newton's third law. Um, Just for more people just to double down on it even more, like talk about why in your, especially in the world of hockey, that just dissipation of force, how poor and bad that is for athletes. Yeah. It's, I mean, the reason athletes like it is because it's more work right? They feel fatigued. They feel like they're working the muscle more. They feel like they're sweating. But that's not an indication of anything. We know this, right? The, one of the biggest issues I have with it is not only how much it dissipates the ground reaction force, but, you know, we want to stick that foot in the ground and accelerate into an acceleration position off that. Now you've got the foot sliding away from you, right? Which is completely biomechanically different than what you're doing. And that is not what we want to train. And you're adding on the, the ground reaction force and the dissipation of forces. It's like clown work. Go get out of here. You know? Yeah, go. <laughs> it's not it's not worth anything if you know you're gonna slow them down, but you know, you take any gifted athlete and you build a relationship, you can do anything with them, they're still gonna figure it out. They're gonna sort it out, right? They're gonna sort out how to play well. But yeah. How about any knee injury as you're talking about, you know, the, yeah. the angle of when you want them to come in, like the first thing that I thought of was like, all right, that boot up in the ankle, does injuries go up the chain for somebody who's not as familiar as you are with uh, hockey or ice hockey? And if any of our listeners are out there feeling the same way, yeah. is that a high incidence of injury at the knee? And if so, what are the common injuries? No, I mean, uh, one, strength matters, right? This is where... You know, you can go through all these iterations of, and this, and this is our, this is when it gets tough, right? Because strength matters to this guy at this time, to this athlete Ooh, at this time. Like it doesn't matter to this athlete at this time. Biomechanics matter more. There's always that you got to be surfing the curve all the time of for each athlete when it matters, when it doesn't. When does power matter? When does power not matter? Does he have enough of it? Good, he has enough, right? So strength of the VMO, the ankle, the adductors matter, right? Those things. Hip abduction, hip adduction, that stuff matters in cutting actions, right? So ankle, three-way ankle stuff matters in cutting actions. We make sure they're strong. You know, we don't start them off cutting at 100%, right? With 70% technical stuff working on it. Um, but no, putting putting the, you know, it's, it's more related. Any injury you're going to get isn't really, I mean, the foot position is one thing, but it's also the hip and trunk. If you're behind the foot plant, you're going to get in trouble, right? If you watch... Odell Beckham tears ACL. He's reaching back here. He sticks his foot way in front of him. And he's not kind of over his center of mass a little bit. And his hip was kind of opened up a little bit. So it's not just strength and it's not just foot position. It's also where the hip is, where the trunk is, where the center of mass is when you're planting as well. So that's something you need to teach as well. I, I encourage everybody to learn how to cut properly. You'd be, sh- I, I am shocked at how that is. It's a big, big, you know, last five years have been all about speed, right? Oh, yeah. Um, What's your max V, bro? What's your max V? And it's all running straight and everything like that, which is valuable. But, um, man, if you – and I ask guys, do you have a model for cutting? Do you have a biomechanical model for cutting? And they all bring out the the 510.5 shuttle. I'm like, what? (laughs) Like, that is not how anybody's going to cut on the field of a field sport athlete or a hockey player, and that's not going to happen. And it's it's actually – that's where you're going to reach some injury, the way they – plant the inside foot is wrong and there's a lot of lot of mistakes going on there it's a it's a useless drill if you ask me it's not how athletes cut or should be taught to cut that way but uh, learn cutting <clears throat> to all the coaches out there that are listening that maybe you disagree with me in my opinion and i'm curious what your opinion is when my athletes would change direction whether we were doing any of our energy system work for change in direction. I never wanted them to touch the ground with their hands. I didn't want them to touch no. the line with their hand. No. And it, that is not how you change direction on the field. And you can have the same discipline of touching the line with your foot as you do with your hand. It's it, right. That's right. So now we're getting it. Now we're getting into something very interesting. This is where our jump series come in, right? Now, if you understand jumping, you can really start talking about what type of cut is it, right? The only time to really lower like that is when you're going to take contact on, right? That's it. But if you're cutting just you personally cutting on air, making a 90, 45 degree cut, 180 degree cut, you, you, I mean, the, the center mass is going to drop a little bit, but I want elastic tendon stuff going on there. 
okay? I don't want the muscle contracting that much. It's too slow, okay? So that's where our jump series comes in. Our jump program comes in to train more short coupling, tendon stuff. You want the cuts to be more of a jumping plyometric nature than you do a muscular nature. And so training the tendons and the muscles to work together, training the thickness of the tendons with short coupling, extensive jumps, things like that, will build up enough to start cutting at full speed now when we get the eccentric strength and some of the strength going on, plus the jumping. That's our model. Our jumping is used really for cutting a lot. You know, it's, it's for acceleration too a little bit or, or for, but that's where the, you know, long coupling stuff we consider for, Stretch, shorten, cycle, and power. Short coupling, we consider for elastic recoil and tenderness stuff, you know, for, for ground reaction times and things like that. So we're always evaluating. We'll, we'll test an athlete and look at their ground contact. Big, strong kid on the ground too much, he's going to get a little more short coupling jumps. You know, tippy-tappy, quick kid, track kid, yeah, you have no power. You might get a little more long coupling jumps, you know, because you can't generate power, especially in contact or someone's pushing on you. So that's where the jumping can get really specific. You know, we use jumping as a means. We don't think it's going to directly relate to, relate to speed so much, but it can relate to cutting very, very, very well. Very well. <clears throat> what will be some of it, like whether it, it doesn't matter the vector in your guys' opinion yeah. and what you found, or does vec, like because they're so novice, hey, let's just get them doing it vertical, and then it does help translate, yeah. or, or how do you go about implementing it? Great question. So we, 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 you know, we look at it as jumping is two feet on the ground, right? And then we look at bounding, and then we look at hopping is you know, bounding one foot to one foot, and then we look at hopping. We're always covering distance, though, when we're jumping. We're never going just really very rare, unless we're testing on a force plate or something, we're going straight up. We're always covering distance when we're jumping. And even, even the... the um, you know, not just intensive, but extensive. We're covering distance. So we'll have series of jumps, two feet on the ground, maybe split stance a little bit too, two feet on the ground. We'll do all these different, we'll even do a little bit of this when we're jumping and they'll go 15 yards and try to get how many jumps can you, you know, when we're going intensive, we'll measure it. But if not, we'll just look at the springiness and then we'll go through some, some bounding series and then some hopping series and we'll change directions and do that. But we'll do both of them. Here's the key. We'll do jumping. So jumping two feet on the ground, short coupling and long coupling, right? So With weight or you would, how do you go about programming it, sorry? Um, but, so typically we'll do body weight. The only time we're going to do weighted jumps is where we're going to measure it. That's really all I'm going to do weighted jumps with, right? We're going to measure it on a, on a force plate or we're going to measure it on a, on a jump mat. And I've got, I'll, show, I'll tell you my jump series, you know, how we do that, which is pretty fun. We're getting some good numbers with, you know, 14-year-olds jumping 30-something inches. So oh, wow. um, all, all day long we're, we're doing that, you know, all day long. We, we, we probably average about 10 inches on a vertical in, in a year on most of our athletes. We, you know, we've got girls jumping close to 30, 28 inches, so no problem. Yeah, no problem with that. But um, so we're going we're gonna to go through a jump series of you're going to jump short coupling, 10, 15 yards. Then you're going to bound short coupling. Then you're going to hop short coupling. Then you're going to jump d deep coupling, long coupling. Right? Then you're going to bound long coupling, which is more, it could be a skater strike, it could be a deep, deep bound where you're going down and, you know, in, inside elbow a little bit. And then, yeah, and then, and then you're going to hop deep coupling, deep, you know, deep tier coupling stuff. It's so a long coupling stuff, which is more balanced hops with one foot out or backwards hops and a little more ground contact time, a little deeper, not deep, deep like a pistol squat. We don't do that. Right? Then we want to start introducing. And we'll go through series of extensive and, uh, and ble start bleeding into intensive in later years or later months and stuff like that and measure those things. But we've got a nice, and really nice jump program with our weights that we do. It's just, it's, it's, we don't need to Olympic lift anymore. If you follow this type of program, like this type of program, we don't need to. You know, if you're good at it and you like coaching it, fine. But it's just, I don't see it. I don't see the, the benefits that we're seeing. So we'll, we'll take... You'll take a certain percentage of a one rep max, and usually a, a strong high school kid will start at 25 pounds in each hand. And you'll give me a max vertical jump on a, on a, on a jump mat. 
then you'll rest 90 seconds and you'll give me one without and we'll do two or three rounds of that right so and, and you record your best jump that day and we'll do this twice a week in the off season next week you'll go to 30 so we wave load it you'll go to 30s you'll do me give me your best jump with weight best jump without two to three jumps of each next week you'll go to 35s the fourth fourth week you're back down to 25 trying to beat that record from three weeks ago your original 25 record and you'll see a kid beat it by an inch or so and so that just keeps climbing that's our weighted jump series that we put people through for years and years and years and you just keep ro you keep wave loading through that 25 30 35 25 30 35 you keep going through and tracking it for a year and we start seeing changes now we see a plateau we might make some changes you know and do something or look at fatigue factors or something like that most people when their athletes plateau they look to add some stuff we take stuff away <laughs> look at some lifestyle things and it takes a little less squatting a little less this um you know maybe a little little more of this but a little more rest and recovery is what we usually look for so when you're doing your jump stuff, <clears throat> are you programming that? Like you said, you're not doing Olympic lifts. Is that right. in your A block, power block, or is that yep. at the end of yep. the warm-up? How do you go about programming it? No, typically it's in the A block, power block. A lot of times we do it with a potentiation off the squat. You'll squat. for you'll, So you'll, you'll come in and you'll do some warm-up drills and work on some cutting technique or some just some technical stuff as a warm-up. And then you'll go through our jump series. You'll jump, you'll leap, or you'll jump, you'll hop, you'll, you'll bound and deep here and short coupling stuff and then uh and then you may go right to the power series of jumping or you may squat first and then jump after so it's for some potentiation and things like that so we might play around with a little contrast training or a little something like that as well for more advanced guys and then you're on to the rest of your program whatever you whatever we programmed for you you know that you need you know whatever it is so usually building general strength after that or you know we get into some specific technical stuff Specialized exercises can come in when you're ready, you know, before you do the jumping and the weight training too. So after after the jumps, we can go into some stuff. I like a lot of Doc Yes's specialized exercise stuff for athletes. I I, I find that to be valuable. Even at Plus early ages athletes. for any of them? Oh yeah, early ages for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I still think some of the basics of running, you know, knee drive, paw backing, ankle extension, those three things that that Doc Yesis preaches, I think those are fundamental in, in, in teaching, you know, how to feel that and, and strengthen that slowly and, and have some motor control in that, right? Um, you know, that, that's probably the, if you want to be a performance coach and really produce world champions and first round draft picks and Heisman Trophy winners, you probably got to understand a little bit of motor learning as well. You know, you can't just, hmm. you, you got to understand because you want to change, the, the real goal for any strength training program first is just build some general foundational strength and maybe some explosiveness but really is to improve the technique the power and the accuracy of the technique that they have to do on the field or the pitch or the ice or the court or the track right so if you can improve their technique of jumping or running or throwing or hitting through weight training measures if your weight training is improving the technique and the power and accuracy of the technique you are doing a fabulous job as a strength coach fabulous job if you can't tie it, you no, know, the initial phases, yeah, you're not going to really look for that. But real good GPP stuff, you'll see some improvement and some technical stuff because their hips are opened up more. They've got a better knee drive. They've got a better ankle extension. They've got a better hip extension, right, when they're jumping or running. So you should be looking for that. Is my stuff improving the power and accuracy of their technique, right? And it could be you could break down the technique to just one joint movement or multiple joint movements. And if you're doing that, you're gonna you're gonna produce some nice results, right? If you're just just measuring the barbell, the speed and the and, and the weight on the barbell, you're you're flipping a coin if it's gonna transfer or not, right? You're flipping a coin. <clears throat> with those high level athletes that come in, you know, you, as we shift gears here now, you've, you've kind of already established who you guys are and what you've been able to do <clears throat> for our listeners out there that are like, all right, how do I get, you know, more of those better athletes or how do you start to build that brand? Because you've been able to right? like your, you know, your website here, we're going to link it down in the show notes, but like yeah. you've got, you know, like you talked about the hockey players, the, the, 
the basketball, the football, like how did it all begin and what is your advice to, to those listening out there? Um, well, you know, one, prove you can get results, even with a young athlete. You take a young athlete and you get some really good results and, and you know, prove your system, prove that you know what you're talking about. Like really be able to sit down with somebody and say, yeah, this, these are the numbers I'm getting off, off these athletes and this is kind of, we think it's transferring because they're performing like, like this. And then you got to go where the athletes are. It's, it's really relationship based with the with the pros and the Olympic guys. Like they they they'll come to me because they'll bring teammates and stuff like that. And you know I've had you know some good success with some guys that were really injured in the NFL came to us and they had career years after. Some of it luck, I think. Some of it. That's got to be so team. rewarding, though, right? It is. It is. Like like one of one of my proudest moments in the last five or six years was Jeff Akuda. Um, oh, you know, okay, two. yeah. So Jeff Akuda, like two years, his first two years in the league, you know, not didn't go well for him. You know, first year blew out his groin and hernia and had Dr. Myers do that surgery on him and 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 you know lost half the year. And then the second year, full rupture of his Achilles, like bad oh. rupture of his Achilles. Yeah. Game one. Oh and they, and they, yeah, and same side as the groin? Know, uh yeah. Yeah. Oh so, fuck. So his his agent and his financial guy said, you know, we think we think we got a guy who might be able to help you, and you know, it was a lot of time and effort and a lot of trust on his part. And he came to us in January of last year, and and you know, before he tore his Achilles, he was tro- clocked at I think twenty one three, and eight. You know, he had the surgery in like November, came out to us in January. We started working on January. He was still on crutches and in a boot, and he ran twenty two in August. Fucking right, he did. And, yeah, and started and started every game pretty much for for uh for the lions that next year we had him so now he's now he's with atlanta and he's gonna have a great year so that kind of stuff you know i take just a lot of pride and, and a lot of work and a lot of luck and a lot of you know i don't know how much credit i can take i was with him three hours a day but teaching him how to remove teaching him how to run teaching him how to jump again it went back to basics he was doing some real basic athletic stuff he was doing our system of jumping learning how to cut properly again he didn't know how to do that stuff well, actually. He was very explosive, man. Very competitive, very explosive. He was he was a, a thoroughbred, you know, and, some, and, he, and he was training like a tractor, you know, heavy squats and a lot of that stuff, and it wasn't working for him, right? But, um, yeah, but I have a biomechanical model of how he should move and how he should cut and how he should rotate his hips and how he should shuffle, how he should cross over, and we started training him with that and started teaching him how to, how to re- uh, you know, be more efficient in his movements, right? And he loves it. He feels pretty good. Stayed healthy all last year, except for a little bit of a concussion. So, how much of it? <clears throat> you just said it there. How much of it with what you're doing with those guys is fueling that competitive nature, and then also doing it, like you said, though, within the model of what you want to achieve in that session? Yeah. Um, that that gets into kind of our our bigger model of my career is is always looked at these athletes that that just because we've seen it we've all seen athletes that are on the track or on, in the gym that put up big numbers but they don't podium they don't win in the championship moments right they don't win medals or, or you know things like that and I, I was fascinated my whole career with what is that what is the difference and I would interview champions I would interview them all the time. And I think, you know, at the top of the triangle of performance is the psychological aspect, right? Is, is how well can you regulate your emotions, right? The best guys in the world are like this. You know, they can, they can re- recorrect the bad emotion in a second, right? Uh, a, a Jordan, you know, a Kobe, a guys like that, right? Look at their mindsets were just unbelievable. And then I think, you know, you have to look at the sensory motor part, like how well can they process things? How well, how fast can they pick things? Everybody talks about the speed of the game at the next level. Well, it's also speed of processing, not just speed of movement. And, and that's something that's trainable, right? You can train how well you pick things up and recognize patterns and make decisions. And your eyes are a big part of that. And we work with, you know, one of the best guys in the world when it comes to the visual demands of sport and how the brain processes stuff. And, and he's, in our, he's in our facility working with us as a partner. So it's fun to see what he does. Um, and then I think the third thing, and this is out of the top of the funnel, is the tactical. How well do you know the game? How well can you set guys up? And then I look at the bottom of the pyramid, three things, is your technique. 
how technically sound are you? I don't care how strong you are. If you don't know how to hit a forehand or a serve in tennis, you, you know what I mean? It's not technically in coordination. It's not going to work out for you. And then, and then physical, all the physical traits, which we can talk about for days. And then there's the recovery restoration part too. How fast and well can you recover, practice more, play more, study more, and, and, and frame it right properly as well. So if you go through all those things, you know, we try to touch on all those. Right? When someone's tactically not good at something, I've done this plenty of times in my career in hockey and football. Um, I've got them with an all-pro or a retired all-pro and said, just go watch film with this guy. Go learn tactics more because that's your limiting factor. You're physically off the charts. Ooh. You're psychologically strong. You know what I mean? You recover like crazy. You're, you, know, you eat well, you sleep well, you hydrate well, but you're still not playing up to your potential. I think tactically you just don't see the game as what you, the way you should be seeing it. You don't process as fast as you should process. So I'll have him work with Ryan, our, our, our processing visual sensory motor guy, and I'll have him work with a, with a veteran guy that's an all-pro and watch film all off season and go through stuff on here's something I can pick up. Here's something, here's a, here's a little trick of the trade. Here's tactically something I can gain an advantage. I've done that a couple times in my career. It's worked well. You know, what's the limiting factor in their performance? It's one of those things. It's one of those six areas. I'll tell you that right now. And, and, and physical, you know, it's rare that that's really a limiting factor. It can be to a point, right? But don't stop there. If they want to reach the highest levels, all pro, first round draft pick, you know, that we've had a number of those in here. And, you know, they psychologically, they're very strong. Sensory motor, some of them are strong, some of them need help there. Tactically, some are really, really good tactically. Like, those are usually the best guys. They're tactically, they're, they're unbelievably good. And physically, not so good sometimes. And I fix that so it's not a, so it's not a problem, right? I mean, look at Tom Brady for an answer. Like, if you look at his psychological makeup, what would, how would you grade him, right? Unbelievable. Look at his sensory motor, how f- quick he picks up things and senses things. Look at his tactical ability. Like, this guy breaks things down so quickly and so unbelievable. But look at the foundation when he first came into the league. His technique, his physicalness, and his recovery was crap. It was People made fun of him, right? So what did he do? He went and built a brand around that. That's how important it was to him because that was his limiting factor. But that's rarely the limiting factor in an athlete that's trained, right? The technique and the tech and the tech or in the in the physical and the recovery. They usually hitting that all the time, all the time. They're training that and they know enough about it. And that's where you can skin a cat up hundred different ways, right? Get them ready physically. Get them ready recovery wise. Clean up their technique. Okay, you just built the foundation. Don't expect them to perform. You know, at, at a level, unless you can somehow evaluate their psychological makeup, their tactical makeup, and their sensory motor makeup. That's where the money's made. That's the best in the world. Those guys are that good in that area. <clears throat> Without giving away your secrets, what is some of the low hanging fruit that you would go with that our listeners can apply? For what? What lane? Improving um, the the psychological lane, like you said, because those that's where the you know the best of the best are able to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really all about um, regulation, right? Your your brain waves, your brain state. So if you can look at theta state and beta state and start studying those things and looking at ways you can get athletes to, to focus on that, it, when it really comes down to it, if I, had, if I had to cover one thing that those athletes do real well, they're in the mm-hmm. moment. They, they, they can train themselves to be in the moment. I'm telling you, like... You know, Freddie Anderson, one of our longtime clients, you know, all-star goalie, he can literally tell me when he's playing well, he's thinking about how his feet, how his toes feel in his boots right before he makes a great save. Like, he's in the moment. He's, he's in his body in the moment. He's not thinking about the goal that just happened. He's not thinking about, you know, what happens if there's a breakaway in two minutes from now. He's in the moment. He's stuck in that moment feeling the, the, the cold air in his breath. Feel, he just senses everything about him in that moment. And that's when he plays at his best. So between understanding the brain waves and the brain states, you know, alpha, beta, theta, you know, all these things, re- research that a little bit, understand those things, understand how you can teach athletes to, to, to manage that. I think it's three areas. I think you, you need to manage your, your emotions. You need to manage your focus, like regulate your focus, because people are going to pull you off focus all the time, right? You're going to focus on something else or get pissed off or do something. Right, and and you, you know you need to fa- and you need to manage psychologically your physical pain and discomfort and fatigue. That's a psychological trait too. 
most special operators will tell you fatigue is mostly psychological when you're feeling it, right? It's not really fatigue. It's psychological. David Goggins, those guys will tell you that kind of stuff, right? So your body has way more in it than what it's telling you. And if you can regulate that message that your brain's trying to give you and, and, and rewrite that, uh, re-regulate it, you're going to be, you know, a pretty tough to beat athlete in that area right there. So, How, Yeah, I mean, you're 100% right. Like, that's why I was having the long pause because I'm just like, man, he's hitting the nail on the head. And I'm just trying to rethink about, you know, all the interactions with – you know, my athletes and yeah. how we, how you can go about just trying to re ingrain that into them because it is countercultural to what is going on and taught into the world. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, it is. But the other thing too, that I, I don't know how much this plays into it. I like to think it does cause it's something I'm, I take pride in, but I think, you know, real leadership tenants, you know, this is what sports is supposed to do. It's supposed to make us better men and women as young people, right? The, the lessons yep. we learn, right? Yep. It's, it's, you know, we, we know it's starting to get away from that a lot, right? It's, it's about winning early. It's about me, 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 you know, this kind of stuff, right? But it really is supposed to be all these lessons of you can't do it alone. You need a team and coaches around you, which is a great life lesson because we can't do it alone. We can't survive alone. We're soft little pink things that need each other to survive, right? Um, you get your ass knocked down, you get back up, you know, your back hurts in the morning, you go to work, you still go be with your teammates and try to get the job done even if you're sore or hurt. These are great qualities of a man or a young woman to have in life when you have a family and a job and things like that, right? These are what sports are supposed to teach us. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I think we're losing that a little bit. So we do teach leadership tenants here. We've got you know, a great friend of mine, like this guy's amazing. He's a, he was a Long-time former Navy SEAL commander, SEAL Team 3, right? So commanders, SEAL Team guys, the, you know, the, I have great respect for There's so much to learn from those guys and respect. But the commanders, whoa, special. There's just some special qualities these guys have that I've had a chance to, to be around. And, and, you know, creating leadership tenants where, where, where there's some real definitions of what is honor, what is courage, what is leadership. You know, we have definitions of what we teach our athletes of what these things are and how to recognize them in somebody and yourself when they're not being met, when they're met. I don't know if that really improves performance. I think it improves the human, makes them a better human, right? Um, but I, we like teaching them. We, we think it's, you know, it's part of our culture and what we teach. And we're very, very clear on the distinctions of, of and the definitions of what these are because language is very important in any team. You know, it, it, it breeds action, right? It's the difference between us and animals. Like, uh, animals communicate, but we have language, which is a very precise form of communication, so we can take action faster than they can, which makes us evolve faster and build skyscrapers and stuff like that. So, you know, if you, have the, if you speak the same language, you can take action with each other very quickly. How are you able to then, uh, if, you're, if you're having, you know, individual athletes coming in, <clears throat> when they come back because are they coming in during their same season? My, my question that I'm trying to get to is like, all right, yeah. you've got these athletes and you've got these unbelievable, f fantastic athletes. Yeah. They go away. And then how are you able to kind of keep those leadership principles instilled in them when they're away? Um, yeah. Because you're not around them the whole time versus if you were with them, if you were their high performance director, or if you were their strength coach and you're just able to constantly be around them, your youth athletes, that makes sense. Yeah. But if yeah. anybody, you know, goes away, you know, to the Chicago bears, or to the ducks. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I give them stuff to read on it, right? We give them stuff to have. And, and, and it, it's, you know, part of, part of the game of, of this field we chose is, you know, there's some people that just come in for the off season and they go do their thing. But most of the guys we're still communicating, touching base with. You know, just really? send them a nice note, send them a DM, send some. Hey, someone had a rough game, send them something on perseverance. Just send it to them. Remember what perseverance is. It just lights them up. They just like, all right, forget that. They don't dwell on it, right? You can just see it. You see because you see the next game, they go out and perform. So we're always communicating with them and still keeping an eye on them. Like we care, right? We care, and it's uh, you know it's not always perfect, but we're, we'll we'll always be. They they know they're going to get it from us, whether they throw in the trash or not. They're still going to get it, and they're still going to get a reminder once in a while. 
um, that this is what it's about, right? Like it's supposed to be teaching you these life lessons. Your, your athletic career, I don't care. If, if this is your life, this is still your athletic career right there, right? It's still small. You know, it can perpetuate a lot of financial success and things like that or relationships or get you a college scholarship and get you educated, but it's still a small portion of your life. And if we can influence some things to make you a better human and hopefully it helps your performance, why not? So, but we'll, we'll give them materials to read. We'll keep on them about it. We, we hear they're struggling with something. We'll send them something, courage or perseverance to read on. But, uh, yeah. So, What has been the most fun and then the most challenging, um, not specific athlete, but the mo- the sport that has been the most difficult and then the most rewarding for you in your personal and if there's like hey two or three but uh, i'm interested to hear that based off of the diverse background of people you've trained yeah i i think my my best experiences well, i've had i've had some good experiences not to brag but you know i've been in two stanley cup locker rooms oh okay right I, I was in the corner uh with Michael Bisbee won the world championship and when he beat Ooh. Anderson Silva in London, I was in his corner. Um, I've been to two Olympics where athletes of mine were competing and being in the Olympic village actually with, with credentials, you know, pretty incredible, you know, experiences to have. So, you know, chalking that up, I think being in the Olympic village, uh, twice with Olympic, with your athletes competing, athletes you've worked, we were working with and counting on competing. That's probably one of my highlights. It was bobsledding and downhill skiing, which downhill skiing was a great thrill and challenge for me to train. You know, the forces, the eccentric forces, the, the oh. Taking a quick break from the show to talk to you guys about our sponsor, Team Builder. If you have any online training platform needs, Team Builder is the go-to place. Team Builder has the ability to integrate with velocity-based training tools, They have the ability to program and have notes and videos for all of your athletes and your clients. This is your number one stop shop. Been using it since 2019 when I was working at Towson. So I've used it. Love it. Make sure you check it out. Go ahead. Click the link down in the description. And with that, let's get back to the show. Incredible. Like incredible. The the vectors, the turning, you know what I mean? The the things that have to happen in that sport and the and the, the courage and the bravery they have and the fearlessness right. they have. Yeah, that was that was that was probably one of my best experiences. Overall, hockey players are probably my favorite athletes to train. They're just usually from small towns. Usually their parents were getting up at four in the morning driving them to the rink when they were young. You know, dads mm. were very involved, and and they've got they got a lot of those qualities, so they're 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 fun to train in that way. Um, but yeah, I think uh, figure skating very challenging. Uh, you know, it's it's I, I I would say that the sports where I've gotten in trouble with figure skaters and gymnast gymnasts before because I said that you don't win anything, and they go, "What are you talking about?" And I said, "You're awarded something. You don't win anything," which makes it hard for me to train you because I I don't like that. And you see behaviors in young figure skaters or young gymnasts that, uh, or even equestrian, you know what I mean? Where there's judged, they're judged, right? The, the judging determines the winning. So it's, it's somewhat subjective and you see parents and people kind of create personas around judges, or around coaches to get to win favor. And it's just ugly. I don't, I don't like seeing it. Right. So that's a challenge for me in those sports when there's, you know, you, hundred meter race, you won. I, it's no debate. <laughs> right there's no bitching and moaning about it you won and where these other sports where there's a judge that, that you're awarded something you don't win it and that's those are those are sports that are hard for me to to to, to get wrap my head around uh, even though we've you know we've had some success and we're proud of our athletes in those sports but yeah it's different it's a, di- it's a whole different beast i like i like seeing our guys win <laughs> No, and like you said too, yeah, like it, it, the puck either went in the goal or it did not, or yeah, you got the sack right. or you didn't. It's it's not yeah, as much right. of a, a judging yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's easier to look at that and make adjustments and and and, and look at your work and see how well it's doing and being rewarded for it too as well. So, but yeah, I would say that that's probably it right there for me. So, 
um, as you're pairing and working with nutrition for all your athletes over there, what are kind of some of the, you know, base three that you're talking with any of your amateur youth athletes and then your professional athletes? What are kind of some interventions that you're utilizing with them or things that you've learned recently that you're like, you've definitely made changes with? With nutrition? Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, when it comes to the, to the amateur athlete, um, we want to look at three things. First, believe it or not, I want to look at hydration. If, if, if we, that's something I've really dug into the last few years, and it's unbelievable when we start testing, we're looking at strips and different technology. Holy cow, these athletes are dehydrated all the time. Really? These young athletes are constantly dehydrated. And if you look at the research of 1% dehydration, what does that mean for brain function and muscle contraction speeds? Wow, considerably different. 2% hydration, holy shit. 3% heart rate up, like, resting heart rate up like crazy just naturally like holy cow so it's a it's a huge factor um and and everybody we're testing is pretty much coming in dehydrated all the time and uh and there's something called reds i I don't know what it actually stands for the nutrition that that taught me it works for designs for sports and she's just teaching me it but we've noticed it too that under eating calories they're just not getting enough calories in you know, calories are very important to get in for athletes, especially young, evolving athletes. Um, and then, then I look at protein and fats and stuff like that. But I, I'll look at hydration and calories first. Like, let's make sure we're getting that off. If you're a shitty eater, I don't care. I want you hitting this calorie in the market. I want you being hydrated. And you'll see, you'll see them just say, I feel great. And then maybe I can get a win with protein down the, after that and things like that. Now, the pros, again, I'm very, very fortunate. You know, I've got two practitioners I work with that are uh, – the best in the world when it comes to blood work based nutrition. So Chris Talley out of Cal, you know, uh, LA with precision food, uh, food works. He's just incredible. He was the head physiologist, uh, of NASA for nine years in charge of all the astronauts and how I met him. It was very interesting how I met him. I was fascinated with athletes losing strength and they'd come back at the end of the year, their season and like down to baseline power and speed again. Right. I'm like, what happened here? Like, I don't, at the end of the year, you're at your weakest and less power. That's not good, right? And looking at muscle mass and things like that. And, and you know, started, started trying some different protocols and kind of figured out that maintaining lean muscle throughout the year anchors some power and some strength where you don't have to train it as much, right? Because these guys are beat up and they don't want to train strength and power that much. But if you maintain lean mass and you're measuring that, uh, you know, the, the, the research is pretty clear. Right around four pounds of lean mass loss, you're looking at a 20% decrease in power and a 20% increase in injury. So keeping the muscle on them in season will anchor some of the power and some of the strength so they don't have to really train it that much because they don't like to train it during the season, a lot of the skill guys especially. So I started researching how can I find ways without training protocols, lots of volume, to keep muscle on them. Why don't I go to the guy that's in charge of astronauts who hmm. go ahead and go ahead and get sick you know i'm just coming off a of surgery so lay in bed for a week when you're sick or injured how do your muscles feel pretty terrible soft. terrible you, there's still gravity there there's still forces on there go up in space for three weeks with no forces how do you think your muscles are going to feel Ooh. yeah and this guy chris talley actually found ways through nutrition and supplementation to maintain lean mass on the astronauts when they're in space I'm like, I'm talking to that guy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going. To- that sounds like a guy that you want to talk to. Right, right. So he's, he's helped me tremendously with looking at micronutrients with uh-huh. pro athletes and how to maintain lean mass and, and, and brain function and, and recovery functions and stuff like that. And the other guy is Jim Laval, who's a functional medicine guy. He does blood work based nutrition as well, who will look at a lot of different factors and, you know, look at different ways so the pros and the olympics they they get right to that stuff right there so i i you know i we they, there's no messing around with that but the other ones you got to start them on the journey where they're ready to step on the on the path right and if they're eating once or twice a day and junk food then i got to start them on let's just look at calories and hydration then let's start dovetailing in some protein then we'll dove, start dovetailing in maybe some some you know some post-workout stuff for recovery and hydration right away, you know, especially if they're doing two a days. Um, and then we start getting wins and we take them as far as they want to take them. But, um, yeah, they can, it can make uh, a difference. Well, yeah. Oh no, keep going. Sorry. It's, 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 uh, it's hard to, 
I, I would say that the nutrition game, because you hear about the guys eating Skittles and so right. performing well, right? Right. I will say that I can I can't claim that nutrition is going to improve your performance tremendously. Although at the high levels, you can see it. You can see a couple percent increase in in nutrition if they get their blood work done and fix some discrepancies or some you know. But I will say longevity, hundred percent. That's one thing I'm proud of is, you know, I've, I've had hockey guys, one guy with a 21 year career in the NHL, three guys with 18 year careers, handful of guys with 16 year careers in the NHL that I've worked with their whole career, like, you know, 12, 14 year careers, 10 year careers. And yeah, and that's, that's something I'm very proud of as well. To, to, you know, whatever piece, small piece I had in that, a lot of luck and a lot of other people working with these guys. But um, a lot of work on my end, making sure that things are working well in the, in the movements that they need to be moving with. And, uh, and I think the nutrition can help make a big, make a big play in the longevity part. Uh, one, of the, one of the questions that I have for you is, you know, over the course of this conversation, just how, like you said, calm, cool, and collective, not yeah. only the best are, but I've noticed that with your personality. A, have you always been that way? But B... <clears throat> if you have not, what have been some of the tools to help you get that way? Because that's an unbelievable quality to have as a coach, especially if you're working with these high level athletes. And like you said, you, you, yeah. you know, you're, you're on that razor thin line of, you know, we got to train them hard, but you got to keep them healthy and they need to be able to perform because their livelihood depends on that. Like, yeah. How yeah. are you able to stay so calm doing all of that? Like, that's impressive. Yeah. Well, again, it, you know, if if you're if I'm being honest, and I think Dan Paff and some of these older coaches tell you the same thing, it probably wasn't until my mid 40s that I really felt comfortable and confident in stuff we're doing. Right, it was really like second guessing a lot. But I, I think the same thing. Some of the special forces. I, so I I've dealt with some sports psych guys that have worked with athletes and stuff, and and I and I found sports psychology to be uh psychology with the word sport in front of it three-year four-year process i'm like no this athlete's got a world championship in six months they're freaking out in their head i need faster help i've learned a tremendous amount from special operators whether it's delta force guys seal team guys especially the commanders and some of the stuff they've you know way beyond the t typical self-help bullshit you know what i mean that you'll that you'll read and you know that stuff has us maybe it's the first step in the journey right but uh you know, these guys, they just understand how to frame things properly, how to make sure you're feeling safe, you know, ways to feel safe. Just, when you feel safe, you can be calm. When you, you know, that, that's what breeds calm. We have, we have a model I was taught by you know, the Navy SEAL commander, how to, how to build confidence. It's a step-by-step -step model on how to build and maintain confidence. And it's really psychological how they how he does it. I mean, it it starts with learning, right? You have to learn something before you're going to be confident in it. And if you learn it long, you know, if you study it in depth long enough, you'll have a little bit of knowledge there, right? But then, what do you have to do with that knowledge? Is that enough? Is is the is the professor at you know USC really really confident that he can go train an athlete? I bet you he's not. He'd probably freaking out inside if he had to, right? But he can go teach all these biomechanics or physiology and stuff like that. So he's got knowledge, but he hasn't put it into practice, right? So the next, the third step is practice. So first you learn something, you learn it deep enough to where you color some knowledge. The third step is now you have to practice it, right? When you practice something long enough and, and intention enough, what happens? You build a skill set, right? And so now you have a skill set. What do you have to do with that skill set to build confidence? You gotta put some pressure on it now. Go into a competition, put some pressure on it. Now, this is the critical part. What happens when you put pressure on it and it breaks and you don't perform well? You're gonna lose confidence so you go back to the drawing board. Do I need to practice more? Do I need to learn more? Do I need to acquire more knowledge? And then you go retest it again, put pressure on it again, right? And then all of a sudden you start winning. Okay, now that happened. Now you got confidence in that skill set, right? Because it has to go through those stages. The problem is practice. Even at the high school level, I mentor and you know took over a program ten years ago, modern day football, which has won some you know, significant stuff, put some big time players out there. Um, Practice at Modern Day High School. Practice at IMG High School. You know, practice at St. Aquinas or Gorman High School is not practice.
because there's pressure every minute because there's a guy standing right behind you that's a five star or a four star trying to take your job. Same with at Alabama or USC or you know Georgia and these these great schools. It's probably not practice a lot of times. It's actually where you're putting pressure on, right? So practice should be you should be able to make mistakes. Riding a bike, right? My four year old falls off. If I put pressure on him that he has to perform or else he's going to lose that bike, he's probably not going to perform well because that's not practice. He's not going to build a skill set. He's going to override that, that section of, of the development of, of confidence. So that, that, that model right there is, is what's helped me stay calm and, and confident through, you know, when I'm dealing with high stakes, right? First round draft pick, quarterback, going to go number one overall, sore shoulder. Freak out or go back and look at, do I have enough knowledge? Have I practiced this before? Do I have a skill set in doing this? If I don't, I'm going to refer out. You know, have I put pressure on myself in this arena before? Yes. Okay, I've got confidence I can do this. I can stay calm and, and, and do this. Right? So I can always go through that model and determine if it's if 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 I have the confidence to do it. If not, where do I need to work or where do I need to refer out? No, I mean that's that's a great point too though, and, and you brought up though at those different schools, how how do you balance that fine line? Because okay, whether it's at those schools or if our listeners, you know, if that's their school, you know, they need to know how to do it there. But even yeah. in those facilities, maybe like yours, where you, you got a bunch of pros coming in and, and high level people, how do you keep the pressure on without creating that world where mistakes aren't allowable and then they can't explore yeah. and get better? Yeah, and that's and that's where where I want to get better at, you know, bringing guys like Jeff Moyer in and stuff like that to, to gamify stuff and, and things like that to put pressure on in a gamified way, that's when athletes play their best innings when they're having fun. You know what I mean? When they're, you know, that's, when they're, that's when their true talents come out, when they're having fun. Um, so practicing that type of thing. Here's some pressure. You're competing right now, but it's in a fun atmosphere and fun environment. Right? The environment yeah. has to be everything. That gets them to build skill sets and put pressure on them. Practice. You should be able to fail and learn in practice. That's where you know the lessons are there. They always talk about every sage has ever taught us that we learn from the lessons we fail at right well we're starting to put sports in at such a young age where you can't fail at all or because there's too many stakes or you're going to get screamed at or yelled at or lose your job well then you're never going to develop the skill sets because you can't play you can't mess around watch bryce young play watch how much fun he has right watch trevor lawrence play watch how much fun he has these guys they got that down right they got that part down. They, you know, so um, that's a big part of it. That that helped me a lot. Stay calm in those situations where there's high stakes. You know, someone's patella knee is hurting them, and they're going into a Olympic cycle of of you know of events to to make the Olympic team for figure skating or hockey, right? Yeah, stay calm. If you have confidence, if you build confidence in that skill set to help that patella tendon through learning knowledge practice build the skill set i put pressure on it because i've done it before i got confidence i can help you or i'm not gonna have confidence in that i'm gonna refer out and just be a part of what i can do for you amen brother well we've talked for the last hour and a half and i greatly appreciate being able to learn from you um we're gonna link all of your stuff down in the show notes but if there's any closing thoughts that you want our listeners to you know kind of stamp of like hey this is this is something you kind of want to end with, um, but I've had a blast getting to learn from you in the last hour and a half. No, it's been fun. You know, I love I love talking about what we do, and yeah, you know, we're always learning too. And we have failures like everybody else, and athletes that you know struggle, and we're trying to figure out how to help them more. But uh, it's not a you know, we're not perfect. But uh, I've been in the game a long time, and like I said, it's probably time to retire. <laughs> but I, I, I would say, you oh, know, my no, advice, this is the time that you actually understand what you're doing. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I would say, first and foremost, the movements that your athlete has to do on the field or the pitch or the track, you have to have a biomechanical model and get help if you need to of what is what are the right positions, the right shapes, the right mechanics, um, you know, and then you can look at how do I increase the force and the power and the and the accuracy of those movements, right? And and if you just build a better athlete there, and then leave it up to you know somebody else to teach their tactics and their psychological, you're still going to do great. You're still going to create some tremendous 
canvases of athletes that can do a lot of great things at what they're supposed to do, not just, you know, basic stuff, right? I 100% agree. I mean, it's it's all about them achieving success on the field. I was talking about yeah. this with one of my clients and his father the other day because they're getting ready to start training with me, but he's um, a high school athlete getting ready to go to college. Yeah. And I'm like, look, we got to just make sure, first and foremost, you got to be able to do well on the field. Like I, that ball yeah. needs to be punted far and high. Yeah. So that way, like you're going to be playing in the SEC. Like let's, yeah. we're going to do this thing the right way. Um, and, and we don't need, like you said, you know, uh, those highly specialized positions. Um, you know, you don't want your punter being sore and not being able to punt the ball well, right? Like yeah. there's only one of them, right? And, and we're trying yeah. to get this kid to to eventually be in the NFL, especially if he's going to be punting in, you know, SEC stadiums for his entire career. So it's like, look, we're going to, we're going to plan and periodize this the exact right way because I don't have a record board of how big or stronger, faster you are. Like, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll track things over time for your report card, but that's not what's going to determine your success. It's going to be, like you said, how good do you feel kicking that ball? How good do you feel doing whatever you got to do? on that yeah. field, the court, the ice, whatever it yeah. is like. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that movement of punting the ball, you know, gets, look at the biomechanics of that, study the biomechanics of what has to happen with the plant foot, with the hip flexor, you know what I mean? With the knee extensors and, and say, okay, now I have an idea of what we need to get good at. And then I think, I think uh, psychological for them too. There's some pressure there. You know what I mean? You're backed up in yep. the SEC with Georgia with their ears pinned back and you're Oof. on your goal line. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how does he regulate get that? that ball off. Yeah. Stay in the moment, right? And, and, and have a skill set for that situation, right? Like, have, ha, have some confidence that you've been in this situation before you know what to do. So you got to practice that situation. So, again, biomechanics, physical, and, and psychological. I would, I would say those are the three things that I would, I would work with him on, those three things. Amen, brother. Well, thank you very much, and uh, you enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Congratulations on making it to the end of the video. Why don't you celebrate by watching more videos just like it? You can also help us on our quest to placate the algorithm gods by liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting. Thank you.